Um, thank you all for joining us tonight for the first Friday in June as we both end the spring exhibition season and begin the summer series of installations. I'm Marianne Redding, Senior Curator here at the Church and Center for the Visual Arts. Before I introduce tonight's honored guest, please take time to read the university's land acknowledgement if you have not already done so. It's important that we acknowledge the indigenous people who are the original inhabitants of the lands on which our campus is located. To learn more about our university's acknowledgement to action plan and resources that are available to you, search for the indigenous Appalachian learning community at workshops.appstate.edu. It has been the Turchin Center's pleasure to host Sydney Stewart's installation Flux in the Hodges Gallery for the past five months. Beginning in the early 1960s, Sidney Stewart's professional career has now spanned 30, 70 years, 70 years, longer if her creative experimentation as a child is taken into consideration. Her early explorations into color and form certainly impacted her, her later life as an artist. Sidney's approach to art making has always relied on innovation and rule breaking. Using the materials and form of painting, she breaks away from the standard rectangle and concepts of framing. For the artist, a sheet of paper is a metaphorical slice of time and space, a context in which to construct ideas about the connections and intersections of consciousness with matter and energy. Sydney has been in nearly 30 museum, 30 solo museum exhibitions, including such venues as the South Dakota Museum of Art, where a career retrospective will be held this will open this October, the Roswell Museum of Art Center in Roswell, New Mexico, the Sheldon Museum in Lincoln, Nebraska, and the North Dakota Museum of Art in Grand Forks, the American Swedish Museum in Minneapolis, the Nordic Heritage Museum in Seattle, the Northern Arizona University in Flagstaff, Arizona, the Plains Art Museum in Fargo, North Dakota, the Sioux City Art Center and the Mon Montgomery Museum of Art, among others. Please join me this evening in welcoming our guest, Sydney Stewart. Um, I want to thank all of you at the Church and Center for Visual Arts for giving me this great opportunity uh, to see all these works on paper that I haven't been able to really see before. I mean, I have them in my studio, but it's not the same as seeing them in a well-lit place. Um, so thank you for that. And I also want to thank you for the beautiful way that you hung the exhibition. So my plan for this evening's uh, conversation is to slowly show some images of the show Flux at the Church and Center, and then show images from my website while I'm just making a few comments about how I think and how I work. Um, before I start talking about my own thoughts, I'd like to bring up a couple of ideas in general about seeing and what, how that is interpreted by other people. For example, um, Mary Oliver, the poet, spoke about seeing as attention, which was the beginning of devotion. That is a very important statement, a way of looking that's concentrated and becomes more than seeing or more than looking. Uh, seeing is much more than looking. The other comment I want to bring up is through David Bohm, who is a contemporary physicist. He says that seeing is always fragmentary. So we never see the whole, we only can see part of it. And the whole is so much grander. It's infinite, it's always expanding and it's always changing. Now, um, I'm just going to kind of leap into some comments about the way I work. First of all, I make art because I want to see what my ideas look like. And so where do these ideas come from? 
Um, that takes me back to my childhood, actually. And I grew up in a little farm in southeastern Connecticut, a couple of miles from the Long Island Sound. And as a kid, being the youngest child, I was kind of sent outdoors to do a lot of playing by myself. And I took advantage of that, not knowing, of course, at that time, that certain things would become very important for me. One of them was the sky. And I noticed that the sky was endless, boundless, and there was constant drama going on. The other thing I paid attention to were trees. Not only the structure of trees, but the intricate networking between the branches and the leaves. So lots of patterns that I paid attention to. I also noticed the inordinate amount of variety in vegetation. I mean, it's just amazing. If you really pay attention, if you're looking, if you're seeing, but not looking, you'll find these things also. So my work is essentially about nature. As I got older, I discovered that the nature that I just spoke about was not enough. It wasn't enough to spur my imagination. I wanted to look deeper, and so I became um, enthralled with what the invisible parts of nature would be like. And in studying science and reading on my own, I have become interested in uh, the physicist's point of view about nature, especially theoretical physics. And in talking, for example, about quantum physics and how things that we see as being solid are in actuality made up of tiny, tiny particles that are constantly moving and at great distances from each other. And yet, when we see them, they appear to be still, still and solid, not in flux at all. Another part of uh, theoretical physics has to do with the electromagnetic fields. These fields are full of so many things and they penetrate everything. They're, they extend to infinity. In those fields are light and sound. The other thing that, phys that physics tells us is that there is an amazing interconnection between everything. That there is an endless unfolding of the universe and that evolution is a constant thing. So that's kind of the background of my ideas about why I make the art I make. So because of that, all of my artwork is abstract. It, they are all visual metaphors for what my ideas are about. And I think you'll notice just in looking at what you've seen so far from the show at the church in Center that all my works have altered surfaces. And I do this because I want to create something beyond just starting on a surface. I want to make it into some kind of form, some kind of rhythm. Uh, some sort of structure that informs me about where to go next. As Marianne mentioned in her introduction, all of my works deal in some way with time and space and the events that take place within those. I think another thing you can see by looking at the works uh, just once presented so far, that all of my works emphasize line. The line can be just a single line down the center of a canvas, single sewn line, or it can be 
a multiple arrangement of lines in some sort of rhythmic fashion. Uh, those lines can be geometric, straight, or curved, or they can be organic. Sometimes those lines are seen in sequences, and I think you can see that looking through the show as well. Um, most of my works deal with gradations, gradations of color. When you see my paintings, you'll notice that a lot more. Uh, when you look at these white works in paper, the gradations will be in size, say of the a wave line, for example, that wave line will change and evolve across the surface. It might change from top to bottom. Uh, it may change because panels overlap. So there are lots of ways of, of um, introducing gradations. Um, and that kind of gradation in color or in line or in rhythm or size indicates to me a sense of time. Um, for example, if you were to drive through a, a, on a freeway through a rock cut area and you notice the uh, sedimentary layers in that rock, that is another way of seeing time. The time that has it is taken to build up all those sediments due to changes in seismic activity or water or wind. I am always conscious of size, of proportion and scale. Some works are small, not too many in this show, but some of them are smaller. And smaller works for me demand a closer view by the viewer. Some, a person has to get up close, has to examine a surface. And if you're presenting a surface at that distance, you want to give a viewer something deeper to look at. If my larger works, though, the one straight ahead, uh, I think which is called uh, Flux Wave, that work is about uh, 14 to 15 feet wide. And it's intended because of its size to kind of create an environment that as you move closer, you become part of that environment. You become, you're in that environment. So those things are important. There's a psychological um, inness in that environment as well as a physical one. So my works are about becoming about emerging out of, about transcending. I make, basically I make works of two different, uh, well, more than that, but basically the majority of works are from two different bodies. Those are works on sewn canvas and works on altered paper. And because of the way I work, I. Uh, transition quite often between working on some canvases and then go into working on paper. And because of that back and forth transition, there's a lot of what I would call kind of cross pollinating between ideas and how to represent and express those ideas. Uh, works on some canvas are a little less flexible in what I can do and works on papers such as these in this show um, because of a new uh, strategy that I discovered in working are a lot more flexible and allow me to do things that I cannot do on some campus. So I'm, I am grateful that I have both of those bodies to work that I can express myself to. Um, the other thing that's probably not noticeable at all to most viewers is that my work depends a lot on chance and accident. Um, 
just the discovery of the um, process of making these works was an absolute accident. And I'll get into that a little bit more when I'm uh, looking at individual works. Uh, I think we can start looking at the images in my website now. Just be, that's okay. I'm going to backtrack a little bit in my biography here. In the 19, I graduated, got my master's degree from UNM, University of New Mexico, in 1960 or 61. And at that time, I and many fellow students were what you would call abstract expressionist painters. It was just something in the air was what everybody was doing, but it wasn't that we were ever told this is the way you should work. It was just something that people gravitated toward. So I was painting in that mode for several years. And in the early 1960s, maybe 1963, so not that many years, I guess, I became a little bit uh, less infatuated with that kind of painting. It, it just did not seem authentic to me. So I just decided to quit doing it um, and tried to, I put myself on a quest of finding out who I was and what uh, was important to me and then how I would express that. So having had a class at UNM on materials and media, which was basically an exploration laboratory type class, I kind of went back to that in my thinking and decided, okay, my studio is now going to be a laboratory. And I just started experimenting with materials. And most of them didn't work. Um, there was not much there that led me to think, okay, this is what I want to do. This, this works. I can see how this, I can anticipate how this might turn into something that has meaning for me. Eventually, though, I, I discovered that one of the things I could do with canvas was sew it. I could make lines in it. And I could stretch those. I could stretch the canvas that I had sewn. Or before I did that, I could slit, make slits in the canvas. And that's what you're seeing here. You're seeing five slits in the canvas that are sewn back, sutured back together with wire and then painted. And looking at that now, I still have this painting. I, I can't really figure out how I did it. Um, it's easy to see what was done, but the, te the technology um, of how I managed to keep those lines straight and not have the surface tear beyond the slit that I put in there. Um, kind of boggles my mind today. So I, I use this technique of making slits in the canvas and sewing them back together. That evolved into not making a slit, but sewing a line or sewing multiple lines and creating a pattern on the surface. So I, did a lot of exploration with sewing the canvas. I, after a few years, I gave up using wire because it was very difficult in a way to do that and shifted to thread. So now my uh, materials for sewing are sewing canvas in order to paint on them are a lightweight canvas that is unfined. That means there's no gesso on the surface. And red. You can see also in this painting a, well, it's not that easy to see, but where the slits are, you will see the wall behind the painting. 
So what you're seeing is a little bit of white wall there. And the fact that you can see into another dimension is also important for me. So that idea of introducing another dimension where light plays the role, uh, which turned up quite a lot in the work that I do, especially in that those paper pieces that version. So I'm going to switch now to another archival uh, work in paper. That's it right there. That's a little untitled piece from 19, around 1960. It's not very big, but it's when I discovered what I could do with mulberry paper. Mulberry paper is a very soft surface. It allows uh, impressions to be made on it when it's wet. Uh, you have to be careful so you don't tear it, but this drawing that you see there is just probably done with a nail. And you can see that I've scratched a grid into that paper and then I've painted it also while it's wet. So here you have, again, an emphasis on line, but line as a pattern, as a grid. Um, a central uh, kind of symmetry that was in the first piece. Symmetry was something that I, a symmetry in composition was something that I used a lot, even though um, almost every design class tells you stay away from sy uh, symmetry because it's boring. Well, I find it not to be boring. I find it to be something that helps me transcend uh, my thinking a little bit. So these, these two works are kind of seminal and these are from like 60 years ago. Uh, so I have not been working 70 years yet, Marianne, but getting close. <laughs> um, moving through is a more recent piece. It's a couple of years old. It's a five panel piece. And here I brought back something that I did a uh, way of uh, organizing the service that I used a lot during the 60s, 70s, and 80s. That is a wave line moving across. But this time the wave line is interrupted. It's repeated in a several different ways. Um, you have it, the, the line that's sewn, a line that's drawn. And then I've also introduced uh, lines that are in graphite that you see little markings of kind of gray lines. And I think that I was able to do that because in the paper pieces that I, the large paper pieces that I had been working on right before that, I would draw my drawings uh, first on the paper before drawing with graphite, be, before drawing them with matte medium. And I liked uh, the fact that the graphite could be seen once in a while. So I thought introducing the kind of a ghost line of drawing adds another dimension. Um, it also creates a different rhythm, a kind of a counterpoint rhythm that goes across the surface. What you see here too is something, another strategy that I like to use is a kind of an interruption. Uh, you have a blue area that interrupts as you walk, as you move across the surface where the white is more dominant, white lines become more dominant and yet it fades out. So you have the gradation of color, the fading, you have the movement across, the movement forward and back. So this is dealing again with space and time and these changes in flux happening across. Another thing that uh, you'll see here is uh, there are five panels. I've used uh, multiple panels in my work since the 60s and these I believe in my own mind are um, influenced by the folding screen that's so 
prominent in Japanese and other Asian art. And I'll get into that a little bit more later, I think. Uh, another painting from around the same time, and a some canvas is uh, Moments of Is. I wish this was a little bit larger, but this is a this is only a few months after the one you just saw. And in this canvas, which is about, this is three sections, so we're still multiple panels, but it's much narrower. It's like uh, 20 inches high by uh, 200 and some inches wide. So it's really, what you're seeing is a really postage stamp version of this artwork. Every line that you see is a sewn line and elevates off the surface between a quarter inch and a half an inch. So it creates its own shadow and light at the same time that the color is enhancing that. So what you also see is a movement, a kind of rhythmic movement that goes from one edge to the other. Once again, dealing with a, a slice of, of space time and events happening in it. These are two paintings side by side, and they are constructed by sewing uh, the canvas in a different way. I was experimenting with actually embroidering on the surface uh, instead of uh, making a raised line by sewing uh, the canvas together. Working this way allows me a lot more flexibility but um, it's also very time consuming. So I think I probably made works in this vein for maybe two or three years. I haven't gone back to it yet, but I also incorporated plexiglass and that's the overlapping painted sides. Uh, and the plexiglass is sewn to the canvas surface. And you can see the lines on that. And then it extends or cantilevers onto the wall. So you see the wall behind it. And then the overlapped part and the patterning on the right. This is another example of that interval that I brought up. Uh, earlier about the slit in the canvas. That's a kind of interval that involves another dimension. This kind of transparent overlay that reveals the sewn part of the canvas, but also reveals something behind the wall and a kind of a, a pattern on top of that wall is something that really interests me. It's, it's adding another dimension. And now that I look at these, I'll probably find a way to uh, reincorporate these ideas and what I'm doing in the future. Uh, pattern is another element of uh, the surface of what I do. So um, you'll, you've noticed that in, in the works at church in the paper pieces. Uh, you see it here in these small canvases. Um, and you saw it in moving through that gray, large gray painting with uh, the wave like forms moving across. So I keep repeating myself. I make the same painting. I've probably made the same painting for 60 years. Um, it's just that they all look different. And I'm going to steal a little bit just a comment from Gertrude Stein who said everything is the same but different. I totally agree with her. Right, now I'm going to move to paper archives to an artwork called Strum.
there it is. Notice in the center an interval. That's the wall again coming through. In this case, this is a um, collage. So all of these lines are where cuts were made in the paper and then glued back together. And I emphasize those by how I paint this. So we've got basically a change of gradation and color going from left to right. We've got a pattern of straight lines that uh, move and angle slightly. We've got some intersections happening. So we've got space time with events happening. Um, it can go to rock cuts, you can go to the sky. Um, it's uh, just another way of expressing the same kind of thought. Uh, this artwork is probably, just to give you uh, an idea about scale, it's probably around 25, 26 inches high and 70 to 75 inches wide. It's a very labor intensive kind of artwork too. Um, it also uh, deals in another way with the idea of sequence. So you have a sequence in color, you have a sequence in line, um, and sequence is all about time. Then I'm now going to go to uh, paper constructions and Nexus 2. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah. There we are. Uh, Nexus 2 is a smaller piece and it's uh, work on mulberry paper, like all of the pieces that are at the church in the center, all the white pieces, mainly white pieces that uh, you were shown at the beginning. Uh, this was one of the first pieces that I did using this kind of technique that is drawing with a matte medium on the reverse side of mulberry paper and then painting on the front side. So this technique happened accidentally. I had mulberry paper and I was experimenting because my studio is a laboratory most of the time. And I decided to put some matte medium into uh, a, a kind of like a ketchup dispenser where I could squeeze out the matte medium. And so I drew this pattern onto the mulberry paper. And when it dried, and I looked at the reverse side, there was an embossed pattern. And I thought, oh, I can do so much with that. And it reminded me of so many kinds of networks, networks that are uh, in leaves and trees, networks that are in uh, the ground when the ground dries up and becomes uh, cracks, uh, networks of all kinds in your body, at your your brain, just, you know, networks are everywhere. They're man-made, they're in nature. And here's another example of gradations of colors uh, changing from the yellow, yellow going into the dark blue at the right. Um, here we have these intervals, but they're, they're fractured now because of the pattern. And so we, I'm introducing the wall again and the shadows on the wall. And if this were hung differently uh, away from the wall slightly, then uh, light would become much more of a partner in the way I work. You would see all kinds of shadows on the wall on the right side. Okay. Uh, I'd like now to go to installations and 
and we can stop there. Uh, this installation, I'm going to show you another detail also, is called In Silence 2 from about 20, uh, 10 years ago. Um, the first installation I did with this material was uh, 2008, I think. And this material is collaged Tyvek. So if you look closely, you'll see all these little cuts of paper, little curved or straight line cuts. They're all glued together. And this piece is made up of um, two 40 by nine foot collaged material pieces and one four foot by nine foot collaged material piece. That's the blue part that's emphasized in blue in the middle. Uh, my first iteration of In Silence One was a passageway that people walk through and it was fairly successful, but um, I couldn't control the light in that place, that site for the work as I could in this space. So what you're seeing here is a work that's pulled away from the wall and people could walk behind it and they would themselves be enveloped in the patterns that were being projected on the wall. So let's see slide uh, the second detail now. So the work came out from the wall, probably an additional, because it's 40 feet long. So what you're seeing on the floor is another 30 feet toward you. And it was arranged in kind of ripples. So there was a sort of reference to water, uh, to wind, to landscape. But the thing that's really important about this is the interconnections, the, the endless sort of interconnections of the method of collaging itself. And those interconnections reference back to how everything in the universe is connected. And when you walk through it, you become a part of that scene. You become a part of those events. Um, I think now we'll move into painting archives again. Okay, this is it. This is Breakaway from 1987. It's a freestanding artwork. The blue part that you see on the floor is six panels sewn and a new material is added here, silica. And you can sort of, it's too bad there's not a detail of this, but you can sort of see the areas that are kind of solid or a little bit model. Those are uh, covered with silica, but then before the silica sets up and dries, the silica mixed with matte medium, I use a kind of a handmade rake to draw the patterns into that, into those shapes. So it's too bad, really, there isn't a detail. But so that's a freestanding. Part. On the wall, you see a lattice that has the outline of the freestanding part in it. And I became kind of interested in this form. I used this um, combination of lattice and uh, the painted um, sort of screens because I was paying attention to billboards. And billboards to me are these great spaces in the landscape that are just standing there, just demanding attention. And I like that idea. And I also like the idea of relating an artwork to architecture. So um, what you see on the wall, the lattice work sort of reflects the architecture of when a house or a building is built, you have the studs in the walls and the bars that, that um, connect the studs. And I just played around with that uh, because I wanted this kind of angular movement going across the surface. Uh, 
I think I probably use this uh, strategy of working for several years. Not all of the pieces I did were freestanding. Some of them were uh, single panels connected with a, a lattice element. Now I am going to go into uh, painting, now paper constructions, moving out. Okay, this is a work in the Churchill show. It's a, I think it's a three or four panel piece. I can't tell right now. So again, it picks up on several things that, that many of the artworks do. Um, it's multiple panels. So we have sequences. It's patterning. It's um, introducing light and shadow. It has changes going across the surface. So we have events, again, happening in time and space. One of the things happening here that is pretty difficult to tell from the slide is that there's one overlapping section where the two panels come forward and they come forward into the room space, maybe three or four inches. So that's uh, an element that I would like to pursue a little bit more. Um, it sort of picks up on the sewn lines and the canvases that you saw uh, moving, a, not moving across, but um, moments of this where those straight lines um, were relief sewn. In, and so they projected maybe a half an inch or so into the room space. This can, doing a strategy like this allows me to bring an element a little bit further into actual space. So we'll see if that, if I take that anywhere. Now I'm going to move into another uh, body of work, um, the scroll paintings. And I'm going to show onomatopoeia first. So scroll paintings are another body of work that bring me back to my abstract expressionist period that I sort of abandoned in the early 1960s because it just didn't feel authentic. Um, I thought it was a little too easy to do. Um, and at that time, I was very young and didn't have a lot of life experience. So, you know, part of me thought, what do I have to express? What's so important that I know that I have to express? So onomatopoeia was uh, painted in um, 2003, so it's 20 years ago. And it just happened accidentally. So there again, chance is something you pay attention to accident of something you pay attention to. I had a roll of uh, calligraphy paper. So the roll is um, 11 inches by 60 feet. And I was looking for something to experiment with in the studio and I saw it there and I just rolled it out. And I had some sumi ink and some brushes and other tools that I could play with. And I started painting on it and um, I got to maybe 15, 20 feet. I thought, oh, this is going nowhere. So I just rolled it back up. A couple of years later, I unrolled it and I thought, looked at it again and I thought, wait a minute, I think I can do something with this. A lot of change in attitude comes with how you look at something. So I may have rolled this out on the floor and walked in it. Uh, so where I was looking at it, maybe what people would say upside down or left to right, but whatever it was, I saw something that I could develop. And so I started uh, doing scroll paintings in 1999, 2000. This one is maybe the third or fourth one 
that I did. So I'm going to uh, tell you that this was in a show called Synesthesia in American Art. And it was shown in a couple of places, one of which was the Albuquerque Museum, and they were only able to show maybe 15 to 20 feet. This scroll is 60 feet long. So what you're seeing here is only maybe 25 or 30 feet. I'm not sure exactly. But the origin of this particular work comes from the fact that sometimes when I'm working, and especially if I'm working on the scrolls, I, and I'm playing music in the studio, I see that music and, and it just makes me, I just make the marks that I think that music looks like across the space. And that's what the black, and uh, mainly the black, uh, represent its sound. And that's what synesthesia refers to, that is translating uh, sound into visual or some other sense. And I think it also relates probably to the fact that when I was a kid, about three years old, I was uh, playing the piano by ear. I didn't play anything important. I didn't play Mozart. Um, they were just little, maybe folk tunes that um, I heard uh, from uh, growing up in a Swedish family. And there was often music in the home. So I'm thinking uh, playing the piano I, uh, has been important to me, but not in the sense of knowing how to read music but in the sense of hearing the sounds and making things up. And I guess um, since I sort of learned something about playing music by playing by ear, I think a lot of times I make art, I paint by ear as well. Um, I, there's one more scroll I'd like to show you a slide of, and that's road breaks. Uh, this is, uh, a recent, more recent scroll, it's on Tyvek instead of a mulberry paper. And the size is a little bit, a little wide. Uh, it's, instead of 11 inches, it's like 12 and a half inches. But Tyvek is a totally different material. Um, and it takes paint and water, which is the, uh, I use a water-based, media a little bit differently than mulberry. It doesn't soak in in the same way. But, um, and this particular scroll is about 40 feet long. I'm using, again, Sumi ink, the black areas that you see there, that's constant. And some different techniques with um, tools that I have handy. I'm, I am, always open to changing the tools that I work with um, and trying different things. So many of the scrolls are experiments in process. One of the things that I love about making the scrolls is that it has allowed me to go and pick up ways that I used to work, but it's also a kind of stream of consciousness uh, kind of approach. Uh, there's not any planning, there's not any anticipating about what comes next. It's just letting things happen and creating a dialogue between what I'm doing and the material itself. And that you could say about all of the work I do. It's, it's always a dialogue between me, whatever ideas are out there in the materials. And that is kind of it for uh, looking at the slides in my website. And I would just like to end with something that, uh, another uh, idea that I picked up from physics. And that is that in physics, um, the observer is considered to be part of the observed. You just can't help but looking at something through the lenses and filters of your own experience. 
And that's a good thing, but it's also a limiting thing in many ways. And for me, an artwork is completed when a viewer takes time to see it, not just look at it, but see it. And it's my hope then that the observed becomes part of the observer. So thank you very much for listening to me and looking at my work. I appreciate it. So we have questions from the audience. Um, please go ahead and put those in chat. Someone's asking how have our industry changed over the years that um, the city's been involved in? Signe, did you hear that? No. <laughs> the question was, how has the art industry changed over the years? How has the art industry changed? Yes. <laughs> well, good question. I don't know. All I can say is there, there are a lot more artists now than when I started. That That is for sure. But... Um, I think the the art industry is more of a business now than it used to be. Uh, and not being in that uh, business myself, I I think the the art industry has more um, control over uh, what is written about it because. Um, for example, uh, if I were a gallery and took an ad, an expensive ad in a magazine, an art magazine, I might be able to get a critic to write about it that would be printed in that. So there's a, a symbiotic relationship between aspects of the industry, and it's become less about art and more about investment, I think. So I don't know. I I don't make art because of the art industry. <laughs> I can tell you that. Signe. Mm -hmm. Um can I can I go ahead with a question? Sure. Um Signe, this is uh Sheila from South Dakota. And uh just want to say again Thank you enough for your presentation because, um, and, and I've heard you speak many times before about your pieces. And uh, every time I hear you, I say, well, I guess I could listen to that again because oh. you, always, you always drop some pearls of, you know, they're just fantastic uh, lessons to be heard, you know, from, from by artists. And um, I, I particularly enjoyed way up front when you said that, you know, early on in the 60s, you put, yourself on the quest to find out who you are. And so I was, I'm, I'm wondering now after this many years, and I won't say how many you've painted, um, uh, how you feel about that quest, you know, you know, did, do you think that you have found that moment? Cause I think that's such an excellent lesson that we all need to start with when we're first starting to learn how to make art. No, I'm still looking. <laughs> yeah, and you know what? In a way, I don't want to find it uh, totally because then there wouldn't. I would have to stop. Right, yeah. right. I need I need that mystery and unknowing and not knowing where the edge is to keep going because I'm always oh. looking for it, you know. And it's elusive. It keeps moving away. So. Yeah, which is a fun thing. I would think to keep it fresh, right? Exactly. We're where do you stand with the notion of uh, abstract expressionist as a title, as a label? Um, you mean a label in general or? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, it's as good as any label. You know, labels are, they're a uh, verbal language. They use the alphabet. Uh, artists use a different language, so. Right, do you have a, do you have a, a different label or, uh, yeah, a different label that you'd use now to describe your, your work? Uh, I don't know. I think metaphor is a, a good label for so much artwork, and it doesn't matter what the style is. It's just uh, 
what the expression points toward. Yeah. 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 So, I'm going to ask you a question that another audience member asked, which is what is what is next for you? And I think that's going to be our last question tonight. Um, okay. Thanks so much. No, I don't know what's next. I, I might know tomorrow. I might wake up in the middle of the night and have an idea. But I'll find out when I go back to experimenting. Experimenting <laughs> always leads me somewhere. So, uh, if, and it's not always a place I want to go, but I'll go. Thank you so much. And thank you to our Zoom audience. And thank you to our audience here at the Turchin Center. Let's give Sydney a big round of applause. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. We really enjoyed your talk tonight. Good.